संप्राक्तचक्रांकण भाष्य सारम यतींद्र रंगार्पित नैज भारम श्रीकृष्ण योगींद्र उपाश्रिए शेन शांति मधिष्ठाय केन कल्याण मुद्वहन प्रेन रक्षा वितन्वान शाचार्य आगत जयतु जयतु नाथो न्याय तत्व प्रणेता जयतु जयतु योगी यो गुह्य प्रवक्ता जयतु जयतु साक्षात्वर्शी महर्षि जयतु जयंद्र Madras, November 1988. The end of the monsoon and the final festival preparations to welcome a hundred and eight Brahmins from all over South India, all experts in Vedic chanting, gathered to celebrate a birthday. Sri Tirumalai Krishna Maturya, scholar, philosopher, poet, musician, and yoga master, will be hundred years old in a few days' time. His closest disciples have come together to pay homage to the man they call Acharya, Master, Professor. <laughs> In order for the Vedic mantras, magic or sacred formulas, to be fully effective, they have to be chanted according to strict harmonious rules. Through the echoing vibrations, Vedic chanting is like an internal dancing that brings about balance and does an ocean of good to the chanter. Now a well-known spiritual leader, the professor has never given up honoring the memory of his own master. Every day he raises his master's wooden shoes to his forehead as a sign of humility. I'm not worthy of the dust on your feet. Feet or sandals symbolize authority. In the Ramayana, when Rama is exiled, his shoes remain on the throne. All over Asia, bands of spiritual hunters worship the feet of the gods and search for the footprints of Buddha or Vishnu from shrine to shrine. An opening puja, a daily ritual to welcome and worship the gods, is taking place in front of the professor's own shoes. The gods are offered a seat, some rice, fruit, flowers, ghee, water and perfume. Naturally, the gods who enjoy being spoiled find it impossible to resist a correctly given offering. Four days are considered a reasonable length of time for the Brahmins to get through the thousands of stanzas. The Veda, the triple science, is an inspired text and the foundation of Indian thought, philosophy and culture. The text is so exhaustive that a Brahmin who loses his cow is said to be able to find it in the Veda. 
The sacred thread, which Brahmins wear all their lives, can only be weaved to the sound of the Vedic mantras. The Rig Veda compares the Brahmins to frogs because they start chanting during the rainy season the same time as frogs start croaking. Apart from the Veda, you must also read other texts chosen by the professor, the most famous of which is the Ramayana, 24,000 stanzas. In the beginning was Brahma, and with him was Watch, the word. The master of ceremonies, Dr. Krishna Moti Shastrilong, reminds the guests of the essential role of metric root. To evoke is to invoke, to name is to create, and therefore to gain supremacy. Indians compare a word becoming reality with the opening lap of blossom. Thus, all recitation is strictly governed by rules of pronunciation, intonation, order, rhythm. The slightest error diminishing, even reversing the expected effect. <laughs> Deva, 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 Deva,
the professor would take part in philosophical debates, a favorite with Indians. He would always win intellectual jousts or oratorical competitions. Fearing no competitor, he resembled Ramanuja, the philosopher who turned into a snake with a thousand heads, each one presenting a different argument. Long ago, in King Janaka's court, Quite apart from the hordes of trophies at stake, the winner used to carry away all the qualifications of the loser. Like in ancient times, the professor and Dr. Krishna Murtisha Strigal are debating in Sanskrit a well-known dilemma. Was Rama right in hitting an enemy in the back for the cause of justice? Anyway, the professor concludes light-heartedly, Ayodhya, who am I to discuss this kind of thing? lesson follows an unalterable pattern. The student prostrates himself before his master. He blocks his ears when he sang his own name because to hear his own name would boost his ego. Prayers recited together put the student and the teacher on the same wavelength, creating the proper atmosphere for studying. Usually, the passing on of knowledge is a private matter between teacher and student, one mouth, two ears. Mantra Om is so sacred that his name must not be taken lightly because he represents God himself. Protect us both, make us happy, give us the strength to work, enlighten our study, let us not grow to hate each other. The commentary of a passage from the Brahma Sutras, a philosophical text from the 4th and 5th centuries, underlines that frequent repetition of meditation is to be practiced again and again. The professor, like every learned man in India, is first and foremost a pedagogue. To pass on knowledge is a necessity, because not to do it would be to murder the divine spirit. The master, the guru, without whom no knowledge can be acquired in depth, dispels the darkness of ignorance. <laughs> The banyan is the most prolific tree in existence. Its branches take root when they reach the ground, ad infinitum, thus eventually creating a forest from one single tree. In the same way, from the Master come an infinity of disciples. Some reflect better than others the Master's quality of teaching. Outstanding was Sri BKS Iyengar, who was filmed at Pune in the 40s. Yeah, 
नित्यम निश्चिर नित्यम पृथगात्मा दृष्ट्वा स्मृत्वा स्पृष्ट्वा विषय बाह्यम This is uh, the famous Iyengar doing his asanas in his uh, younger days, perhaps in 1940s again. You have the Vatayan asana, the Pasha asana, the Upevishtokan asana, the type of Maricha asana and Bharadwaj asana. Iyengar, a yogin as well known in Europe and America as in India, Disciple and brother-in-law of Sri Krishna Macharya used to practice a classical kind of yoga. This type of yoga, physically demanding and nowadays reserved for children and teenagers, was at that time taught by the professor. The starting point of yoga is a mentally and bodily cleansing with no entirely passive elements. Ideally, yoga should lead to a clear mind. It is, above all, a way of acting. A master and his disciple never lose touch with each other. For the professor's centenary, to pay homage to his master, Ayengar carried out 108 salutations, backwards. There are very few people who can do this posture, called the Trivikramasana. One leg held up straight. The student's name is Keshava Murti. He's dead now. These are some of my father's royal disciples. He used to go all over India at the invitation of the Maharajas. There were many Maharajas those days to teach them yoga. So this is uh, some of the uh, kings who used to take yoga lessons and they also had some photographs taken. This is for example the Maharaj of Kolhapur. This is the royal family doing yoga, the palace, Baroda palace, the king and his family and his physician. The physician of the king, the king and the professor and the family. We also have here a very interesting photograph of uh, my father's uh, very important disciple, the then Maharaj of Mysore, Sri Krishna Raja Vadayar Bahadur. Krishna Macharya was born on the 18th of November 1888 into a well-educated Sri Vaishnavite Brahmin family in Muchukundapura, Chitraduga district, Mysore state. Mysore state, now Karnataka, had been governed since the 16th century by a dynasty of enlightened sovereigns. Around 1925, the professor succeeded in curing the Maharaja Krishna Raja Wadaya Bahadur from a serious illness by combining yoga and Ayurvedic medicine. He then became the monarch's acharya, teaching him yoga and philosophy, and opened a yoga school in Jagannan Palace, patronized by the royal court and foreign guests. He directed the school for more than 20 years, right up to the final successor of the Maharaja and the independence of India. He was then called to cure an important official who was struck by paralysis, and so he set up home in Madras. He was brought up by his father, his first Acharya, until he was 16 years old. He then became a disciple of various Acharyas from the Mysore Institute of Philosophy. Following Hindu tradition, he revered them as the representatives on earth of God, the primeval guru, even including the Acharya who was his classmate at school. Around 1915, at Benares in Calcutta, he learned Hindi, Bengali, Urdu and English. He was already fluent in Telugu, his mother tongue, Kannada and Sanskrit. He also studied grammar, Ayurvedic medicine, music, astrology, and the six philosophical systems of India, which later earned him diplomas from the universities of Patna, Calcutta, Benares, Baroda, Navadvipa, Mysore, and Allahabad. To further perfect his knowledge, he went up to the Himalayas to join a wise old man who lived in a cave more than 12,000 feet up. He finally reached Mount Kailash in Tibet which is where Shiva lives and is considered as the world's axis. He 
Near the source of the Indus, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, pilgrims come to circle repeatedly around the sacred mountain for four days. Sri Krishnamacharya even bathed in the sacred waters of Lake Manasarabar. He spent seven years with the master Sri Ramamohan Brahmachari, who taught him all the poetry, verbing and therapeutic techniques of yoga, in addition to his philosophy. The only visible signs of this adventure are his master's wooden clocks, which he worships every day, and an album of drawings by his master's daughter. This photograph is something like the photograph we take after the convocation in India after we have received all the certificates. And this photograph was taken around the time he got married, approximately 1925. This is the photograph of our uh, Acharya, Sri Krishna Acharya, taken for a book, the first book my father wrote on yoga in 1934. My mother tell, told me that this book was written by my father in two days. And these photographs were taken by this photographer of the Palace of Mysore in 1934. We have such excellent photographs, including this posture, the posture known as the Samasthiti. This is the first position one takes before doing different asanas. We have this photograph also in the book, the Yoga Makaranda, which is uh, here. You see, the Brahmins and other castes have to wear the sacred thread, the Yajna Pavitam, throughout their life. You see this Yajna Pavitam. Usually, as you have seen, it is worn. It runs from the left shoulder and goes down to the hip bow. But when the professor does his asanas, he wears them with, but in the same fashion, except it is going around the neck twice and then worn like that. This is the way one should wear. <laughs> stated that yoga should be adapted to the individual and not vice versa, depending on desha, place, deha, constitution, kala, time, vritti, activity, marga, taste, and shakti, potential. The professor has always honored these concepts. In addition, he was the first in his time to combine the effects of postures, asanas, and controlled breathing, pranayama, to reject a notion of unnecessary austerity and to apply the principle of vini yoga starting from reality and progressing step by step. channel the mind's diversities in order to reach a united perfection of body and soul. Speaking of perfection, in the Mahabandhasana position, the professor can arrive at an exact replica of a 2,500-year-old seal of the Proto-Shiva of Mohenjo-Daro, Prince of the Yogins. We have here the latest book, the last book of Sri Krishnamacharya, printed and released in 1981, when the professor was more than 90 years. And in this book, we have 
the photographs of the professor himself doing some of the asanas those days. These photographs were taken for this book. The different ways one posture can be adapted. See, the same position, you sit in Paschimottanasana and you do so many positions of the body. Something he discovered those days, he thought people do not have one hour or two hours of time to practice, so he combined so many postures and let them do all these postures, so they have at least a little bit of the benefit of all these postures. So he linked, you can see that here, he took Padmasana, Padmasana bending, Padmasana twisting, half Padmasana twisting on the other side, then he would go to Matsyendrasana, different types of Matsyendrasana, then he would combine to Mahamudra, Marichasana. The professor has asked the photographer to take the front view and the back view. Because sometimes you, things look beautiful in the front view, but not so beautiful in the back view, because we know how to cheat. This posture exhibits the quality of the mastery of the body. How? When the breathing is mastered, even the spine is affected by the breathing, is seen by the folds that appear here when he has done the bandhas. Usually these folds do not appear when one sits in this posture. You have to really pull the rectum and contract the lower abdomen for this to be tightened up. These photographs were taken to show the different gestures and the positions used in what is known as the Sandhya Vandaram. That is the daily prayer to the sun. Yes, one has to squat for taking the water, to do the pranayama, to take the water, to offer the water to the sun. Some posts in at certain points one has to stand and do the pranayama. And then the gestures which you saw, the mudras, and then offering the water to the different gods. You can see the thread is exactly in the same position as usual. And then nyasa, touching the different parts of the body with the mantras. And then you can see for example the japa. When you do japa, the counting should not be exhibited. So always a towel is kept to hide the finger which, are, which is counting the japa. It is said that without the sandhya, the twilight ritual, the sun wouldn't rise. In order to encourage breathing, some water must be drunk. Then several drops must be sprinkled as an offering to the sun whilst reciting the Gayatri. This prayer, strictly reserved for the Brahmins, also symbolizes the goddess of solar energy. O divine sunlight, may we have you with us to guide our thoughts. The Gayatri is to be recited a hundred and eight times, or at least a dozen or so accompanied and followed by a series of strictly codified gestures or mudras. The professor would never dream of skipping through a ritual. The rigorous exactness and strict observance of the smallest of details are the only guarantees of the ritual's effectiveness and of keeping up tradition. I think my father also had taken my first son and uh, he asked the photographer to take some photographs of how children are taught by the parents. So you see my son doing shoulder stand on the lap of the professor. This is the way children were taught because children feel much more warm when they are taught on the lap of the grandparents. So this is how we, our children were taught yoga by my, grandfather, my father. the professor was teaching yoga to women, to his daughters and to his wife. However, when he decided in 1964 
To pass on Natamani's teachings on the subject to his disciples, the practice of yoga for Indian women was still coming up against strong resistance. As for the professor, he had long been welcoming foreign women amongst his students. This is one brother, my elder brother and my sisters doing yoga Padmapadmasana. My father, with his young disciples, to show to the public the different aspects of yoga. My father used to arrange some lecture demonstrations in the 1960s, and he would take some of his close disciples, including my small sister. You find the professor explaining one of the parighasanas as my small sister is doing it. And you can see us watching behind and waiting for our chance. was able to even handle people who are known more for their obesity than for anything else. For example, this gentleman must have been at least 100 kilos and my father was able to teach him even Sarvangasana, Halasana through great care. He used to train us how to teach. So he would always have one of us with him when he was teaching these difficult people. You find here my brother Shribhasham doing asana with the set who was so fat for people who have some stiffness and all that, he was using certain instruments to help them to bend the body. This is very popular now in the United States. Yoga is taught with a lot of instruments, uh, but the origin of this is as old as 1930s. In 1930s, our Acharya was traveling all over India to talk and show the yoga practices. He would do lectures, he would demonstrate asanas, he would show the effects of yoga, for example, he has demonstrated more than once the possibility of a human being to st stop the heartbeat. Two minutes you stopped heart. That was mental control or physical control? But the mind, not, not only the mind control, mind and the prana and the It was not only mental control. Prana, vital energy and atma, soul were also involved. It was controlling the energy at the same time as mastering something secular, something which went far beyond. Every individual has the right to the same number of breath in their lifetime. Thus, slowing down your breathing lengthens your life. The importance of breath control in yoga comes from this principle. Ayurveda is the ancient Indian medical science of longevity. It is based on the doctrine of the three humors, wind, bile, and phlegm, which must be well balanced to prevent illness. Although taking the pulse is generally considered only as one element of the diagnosis, the professor can draw from it a multitude of information. The combination of yoga and Ayurveda can be both a prevention and a cure. The professor calls it a veritable surgery without instruments. taking place in various parts of the town in honor of the professor's birthday. TV, radio and the press are recording an event which the governor Alexander insisted on being a part of. 
The government is the highest political authority in Tamil Nadu, a state with a population of 50 million on Coromandel Coast and with Madras as its capital. On this centenary anniversary, a course on the teaching of yoga to mentally handicapped children is being held. This particular application makes up an important part of the therapeutical activities of the Institute for Manjuran, which was started by one of the professor's sons. Traditional dancing and gesturing are taught alongside yoga. The yoga postures are accompanied by sounds which are aimed at easing breathing out, the most vital of the four breathing phases in yoga, at holding the positions and at concentrating, all with the goal of improving coordination. After all, the word yoga can also be translated by adjustment. He's come. He wants all of you to see. namagi festivities, Nalgudi Sri Jayaraman, one of the best known sovereign Indian violinists, is going to play Carnatic devotional music for several hours in homage to the professor. It will be a delight for the amateur public, as well as an offering intended to charm the gods, who are great connoisseurs of music and always eager for enjoyment. of meanders, convolutions and echoes, just like the pattern of Indian thinking, which prefers to add elements rather than to have to take them away. In the same way, religion multiplies ad infinitum the various facets of the one and only God. In the same way, operate architecture, sculpture, painting and drawing. Colors are auspicious motifs that Indian women draw on their threshold in honor of Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity. To prepare for the climax of the festival, a huge column will be adorned with 108 pots. They will have been covered with the threads that symbolize the 72,000 canals of vital energy and give the pots life. In Hinduism and Buddhism, 108 is a symbolic number, and besides mantras recited by 108 priests will be 108 times more effective. If the professor has chosen this number, it's possibly because if spiritual life begins at the age of eight, a person doesn't become a real centenarian until they are 108 years old. The reason for this choice is also definitely because the professor added to his age the eight syllables of his favorite mantra.
At dawn on the first day of the final ceremony, in the entrance hall of the temple, the 108 pots are not ready to fulfill their role until they have been given a head of coconut, mango tree leaves for their hair, their million marks for their eyes, and finally filled with water, signifying life, knowledge, and fertility. The first day is not of the Nyagas, big Vedic sacrifices, which were offering rituals to the god of fire, Agni the messenger. Agni's task is to seek out, to invite and to welcome the other gods, and then to offer them the gifts which are placed in the fire and are the source of their energy and immortality. After the litany of the thousand names of God, the Sudarshana Haman, the sacrifice which glorifies Vishnu's discus, the Vapau, is carried out. Nine officiating priests each throw ritual delicacies into the fire 224 times, making a total of 2016 times, to the sound of the mantra chanted 40 times by the 108 reciting priests, making a total of 4,320 times. Whatever that number, Hinduism has its multiple, Andre Malho once said. the ceremonies is the actual birthday of the professor. Whilst accepting that the celebrations be organized, the professor stipulated that the blessings prayed for fall not only on him and his family, but that they might be bestowed globally. The act of the sacrifice bears fruit, but the accompanying wishes are only granted in direct proportion to the degree to which the rules are respected and to the amount of the means used. A big sacrifice costs an absolute fortune. Quite apart from the offerings and the priest fees, more than a hundred people have to be fed and lodged for the eight days. As for those who are still reading, they have only got a few hours left to get through the thousands of strophes. and sacrifices which aim to overcome all possible obstacles, to encourage long life and to worship the seven planets, the sacred water is taken out of the Pradhanakalasham, the main pot, 
and is sprinkled on the professor and his family, just like the Abhishekam, the royal besprinkling in the ancient coronation ceremonies. showering the professor endlessly with gifts, speeches, and signs of deep respect, the people are given prasad by the professor, sacred rice and water, and ashes from the sacrificial fire. the leftover water is poured over the deified statue of Patanjali, a second century BC philosopher, grammarian and doctor. The statue is in the garden of the Mandiram, the institute where the professor's teachings are practiced. In the eyes of the participants, the ceremonies will have been a conclusion and a climax. For the professor, however, his attempts to teach and to make yoga more widely known never come to an end. From Patanjali, the philosopher and intellectual guide he most respects, along with Nathamuni, he borrowed the Mandaram's motto, the suffering to come can and should be avoided. Aside from the group lessons for children, the Krishna Macharya Mandiram aims, above all, at applying the principles of yoga during private consultations and lessons in order to relieve certain discomforts and chronic ailments. This method, apparently simple in the extreme, is based on specific postures and relaxation using various tools, including breath control. It should be applied carefully and flexibly with no ready-made recipe. Jump forward to Dandasana. The most spectacular positions are nowadays only taught to children still supple and energetic. The modern lifestyle makes the practice of this kind of yoga less and less desirable for adults who are generally tired and rushed. It's therefore best to practice a yoga that matches the individual's needs and capabilities and to teach yoga following the principle Yukta Shikshana. I will not teach you what is good for me or for others. I will only teach you what is good for you. In any case, yoga can only survive in the modern world by adapting itself. After all, its goal, for reasons of practicalness and efficiency, is to create harmony and balance, thus allowing each individual to get the best out of himself at the same time as being able to integrate himself fully into society. Oh, I'm going to 
Every man has three debts to pay during his lifetime, to the gods by offering sacrifices, to his ancestors by worshipping them and by ensuring the continuation of the family line, finally to the sages by studying and handing down knowledge. Following the code of Manu, the first king and legislator, the ancestor of the human race, having studied the sacred books, having procreated sons, having given sacrifices to the gods, each according to his own means, a man can seek freedom. Sri Tirumalai Krishnamacharya, the professor, has more than fulfilled his three sacred duties during a life full of ebullient, adventurous, multifarious, never-ending and demanding activity. He has finally reached the stage where he can dedicate himself to entire devotion, bhakti, done out of love and surrender, freed at last of all speculation. The puja is the most common ritual, the most family oriented the most familiar. The professor will have never stopped practicing it with rigor, vigor, and fervor, day by day, for a hundred years of beatitude. Om Apuva Yugam Sarvam Mishra Bhutanya Pranava Apaha Pasiva Apo Muzum Apo Namapa Sambrada Apo Virada Apo Surada Apo Chanda Ushra Apo Yogi Ushra Apo Veda Mantra Swarupa Namo Namo Jnana Pandita Swami Namo Namo Vehe Koti Nama Shambhu Kumara Namo Namo Bhoga Antari Bala Namo Namo Naga Bandha Mayura Namo Namo Parashu 